All right. Good evening, everybody, or good morning or afternoon, whenever you decide to watch this. Um, since since I will not be in class uh, on Tuesday, which is tomorrow or today, um, I'm recording this lecture ahead of time. I'm sorry I will not be able to be there, but I will be in class on Thursday to answer any questions you have here or you could show up to an office hour or set up a time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Um, first, I just wanted to go over a few um, updates, things that have happened. Um, one is, I mentioned a monomer list, I think maybe in the first class. So this is a list of monomers and just sort of common polymers that we encounter. Um, since there are some special names like acrylate or styrene that are used fairly casually, um, you can sort of make a, a little sheet that I made that summarized them for reference. Um, this can be found in the class materials folder on Canvas. Um, thank you to Jacob for noticing that I had not posted that, and I apologize. Um, another thing that I, I have uh, uploaded as well is a list of topics for the um, special topic paper. Um, so these are sort of suggested um topics they are not ones that you have to choose from um, i will show you sort of the list that are there um, these are a variety of different um, areas of polymer chemistry that i personally think are interesting or would like to read about um, so i would encourage you to look through this list see if anything jumps out at you if something looks like a weird name perhaps you know google it see if it's something you'd like to learn more about um, the idea is to identify uh, several recent papers on these topics from the literature that are from, you know, um, good journals to sort of hopefully ensure that this is some um, fairly impactful work and kind of summarize, compare and contrast to give an idea of where the field is right now. Um, the idea is not to just find a review and summarize a recent review. I'd really like to see um, individual papers kind of summarized and sort of um, compared and contrasted and summarized by, by you. If there's a topic that you are passionate about or that you would like to do, um, feel free to run it by me and I will most likely approve it. Um, there'll be a way to sort of submit uh, selections from this. And mainly I just wanna make sure there isn't too much overlap in uh, content between individual uh, class members. But given the size of the list and the number of people, usually this isn't too much of a problem. Um, think, yeah, that's probably all on the update end. Um, going into what we did last class, uh, we continue to talk about step of polymerization. Uh, we talked about molecular weight distributions, and particularly we did some sort of probability analysis of uh, different chain ends reacting with one another. We came up with what was called the, the Flory-Schultz distribution, which is um, if you have a polymerization starting with a certain number of molecules and you reach a certain conversion P. Um, this will give us an idea of how many of any given polymer at a given length there is in the mixture. And this just refers to, uh, associates the uh, number of reacted molecules to the number of unreacted molecules. So we have this exponential that will increase as we want to consider higher order oligomers or uh, polymers. And perhaps at the end of this, we did a little bit of math and um, came up with an expression for dispersity, which actually ends up being fairly useful for step growth polymerizations under ideal conditions where the dispersity of a uh, polymerization theoretically is one plus the fractional conversion. So um, the the further you go in a polymerization, the broader this distribution will get and should end up around two if you reach very, very high conversion. Um, next, we talked about sort of the pros and cons of bulk polymerizations versus solution polymerizations in terms of kinetics, uh, potential exotherms, sort of processing and viscosity. Um, we went over a number of methods for polymerization of aliphatic amides. Um, this is just from say direct um, solution reactions of an amine and a carboxylic acid, but also considering some of the more specialized conditions like interfacial polymerizations um, advantages that may have. We looked at ring opening polymerization of capital lactam 
and also the interesting scenario where you take two different um, AA, BB, um, diamine, and dicarboxylic acid monomers, you mix them together, they do acid-base chemistry to precipitate as a one-to-one -one, uh, salt, so that inherently gives you the stoichiometry you need. That can then be heated up um, above the melting point of the final polymer to lose water, which is driven off under that heat to give you polyamides. And, and the last place we ended up with was on aramids. These are aromatic uh, polyamides. And these are made in similar in a similar fashion from acid chlorides and aromatic amines and anilines. Um, these usually have um, slightly higher performance abilities where they have better heat and flame resistance. They usually have very high TMs given their uh, rigidity, high strength. And, and the, we talked about the importance of this catenation angle on sort of some of the properties where they can exist as sort of a coil in solution or things like Kevlar end up being rigid rods. And, and Kevlar is uh, where, where, we, where we left off and we're gonna continue talking about that a bit more. Um, there, there was a question last time on sort of generally, why, why are rigid polymers less soluble than, on the whole than a flexible um, Polymer. So why are these these very rigid polymers so um, hard to dissolve? And I and I looked into this a bit more, and honestly, I couldn't find a whole lot of like old literature on this. I'll, I'll keep looking to find maybe more explicit. But re regardless, when we think about solubility, um, usually this is the interactions uh, between solvent molecules and the polymer chains. So if the solvent molecules are able to interact with the polymer chains, and um, they're a good solvent, then we have sort of positive interactions between the two. This allows the solvent molecules to surround the polymer chains and kind of maintain them in solution. So part of this has to deal with uh, sort of like dissolves like, this mentality. Um, people look at things like um, Hansen parameters to evaluate these qualities, but that doesn't really take into account an idea like rigidity. Um, and and, I, and I, I still suppose that the the competing interaction, if you don't have solvent molecules that are able to go and uh, solvate the polymer chains efficiently, it's competing with sort of chain chain interactions. So if two polymer chains like each other more than the solvent molecules, then these will start to aggregate together and then precipitate from solution. In the case of like Kevlar, we have extra um, things to consider where we have these, this you know, elaborate hydrogen bonding network that reinforces that they really like to stick to one another. And frequently I would suppose that uh, for other systems that also lack these types of hydrogen bonding motifs, probably their intramolecular interactions are also uh, considerably higher. Um, I still think there's, there could be an entropic effect of having this much ordered solvent around a fairly um, a, a polymer chain with very few degrees of freedom that probably makes it more challenging for solvation as well. Um, so there's, I guess there's a, a number of factors that can kind of go into this. Frequently, if you have a rigid polymer and you want to make it dissolve a little better, um, you add on side chains that will increase its solubility. And that's something we'll, we'll see uh, here in a few slides on Kevlar derivatives. Um, but, but for this topic specifically, um, I want to talk about processing Kevlar because, because it does have this hydrogen bonding network. It's incredibly hard to dissolve. And so, to some extent, it's hard to make high molecular polymers sometimes because they tend to precipitate ahead of them. And things like Kevlar are frequently referred to as uh, rigid rod polymers. So in a lot of ways, you can think about them as being literally a sort of um, just sort of almost rod-like in shape where you have these long segments. This doesn't mean that it is truly a flat rod in, in solution. They can bend to some extent, but they have very long persistence lengths that will kind of maintain this elongated shape. And because these behave as long um, rigid units kind of linked together, there are some special properties that can emerge. And uh, one in which the uh, Kevlar possesses that uh, is taken advantage of, especially for processing, for making things like fibers. Um, and that, that idea is called liquid crystallinity, or it can form liquid crystalline phases. So the, the term itself is kind of like an oxymoron, right? Because how can something be you know, a crystal, which you usually think of as a solid, and a liquid at the same time? So it's you know, somewhat counterintuitive. But this just refers to uh, liquids or substances that have long range order. So there are different types. Yeah. 
there are different types of uh, liquid crystalline phases in the general sense. Uh, these liquids can either uh, be in the melt, so there's no solvent around. This just means the substance alone without any solvent uh, behaves as a liquid crystal. Uh, these are called thermotropic liquid crystals, or you can even have concentrated solutions of polymers or even small molecules that have uh, liquid crystalline phases or behavior. And, and these are called lyotropic uh, liquid crystals. So the, in the context here, Kevlar will be used as a lyotropic uh, liquid crystal, so it will be with solvent. Um, the, the key characteristic of this is this idea that liquid crystals have uh, anisotropy. So they are anisotropic. And this is a unique characteristic in which um, you have properties that uh, vary with, with respect to direction. So they're not fully homogeneous. If you kind of look at them from one direction, they may have different optical or um, different viscosities depending on which way uh, you are um, interrogating them. And this is in contrast to normal liquids that are isotropic. Um, they are fully random. They do not display any long range order and they will have the, the same properties in all dimensions and all directions. So, so at the bottom, there's a sort of a picture of a, a few different cases. Uh, there's really numerous different classes of liquid crystals. Um, here we see at the far end, we have a, a liquid. Note that all these different uh, sort of molecules displayed as these rods in solution are all pointing in different direction. Anywhere you look, you don't really see any organization between them. Um, you can have substances that are called uh, pneumatic li liquid crystalline phases. Um, these have a bit more order to them. Note that they are um, all going in the same direction. We have directionality kind of in, in this plane where they're all aligned in, in, one, in one fashion. So there is order at least in one axis here. So they have you know, some order to them. These are not layered. And you can compare this to a smectic liquid crystal where now you see that we have order now happening in two different directions. We have them aligned vertically and we also have these layering effects. So now you can see where these similarities to um, normal solid state crystals um, emerge where crystals are um, uh, perfectly arranged in all dimensions. So these still don't necessarily have regular spacing between each of these molecules. So there's still some disorder that don't make them perfect crystals in their own right, but we do have an added layer of order. So these have more order, these are layered. And along with this, we also are able to see some different properties in um, viscosity. So actually pneumatic liquid crystals are less viscous than smectic. and smectics would be more viscous. And perhaps if you imagine flowing along the direction of, of the arrow, you can see how these types of rigid rod molecules can kind of slide amongst one another. Whereas when they're all organized in these sheets, uh, when you try to flow, they may aren't able to slip past one another because they want to kind of remain in their existing area. And so in, in, the, in the context of Kevlar, um, this is used to an advantage in processing because we were able to order them into these liquid crystalline phases whenever um, they, they are concentrated. So, so if you are in a dilute regime, then we're gonna have still these uh, isotropic phases where we're gonna have Kevlar in all sorts of different directions. They're not gonna have any order to themselves. They're just gonna be kind of chilling around, going willy nilly doing whatever they want to do. And what we're going to do is imagine in this axis, we're going to have two parameters. One is going to be concentration of Kevlar. And on other axis, we're going to have viscosity. So as we increase the concentration at Kevlar, um, we're going to see a dramatic increase in viscosity as we get more concentrated. This is normal behavior for polymers as they get more concentrated. 
uh, there can become um, chain chain entanglement that will then lead to uh, decreased flow. And it's going to reach this point where all of these isotropic um, polymers will now start to order with one another. Where now we're going to get these some directionality of these rigid rod polymers developing. Um, initially, they may not necessarily be all exactly in the same order, but we can have them kind of gather together and see how they will start to align. And when this happens, um, if you try to apply flow to them, then these will begin to align with the flow, so they're all able to kind of go in the same direction. And as you increase the viscosity of Kevlar, after we reach this uh, transition to a liquid crystalline phase, this will actually decrease in viscosity. Uh, this, is, this is really nice because now you have even more concentrated solutions of Kevlar that also has uh, lower viscosity for flow. And then if you were to continue in this regime, eventually you would start to increase the viscosity again. And, and you can notice sort of just uh, physically the, the changes in properties as well. Uh, they're frequently um, opalescent in appearance or iridescent. And this has to do with how the anisotropic behavior of, of light can interact with these domains where you don't have necessarily, um, you, you can have uh, diffraction of the light in different ways. So you get these sort of you know, rainbow effects or swirly looking uh, milky, cloudy substances in, in your uh, um, solution. And, and actually, um, as we mentioned last time at the discovery of Kevlar, they initially had these sort of milky suspensions developed that they thought wouldn't really be good for anything. And then I guess just out of, you know, just to see what happened, they tried to make fibers and these fibers ended up being, you know, higher strength and better mechanical properties than really anything else that, uh, um, they, they had at the time. And so usually you, you will, will directly take these, make fibers, then you can of course stretch them to um, increase their properties afterwards. Um, and, and also I would note that the, the solvents that are used are, are not very nice still. So even to get these to go into a um, solution at all and, and make these types of liquid crystalline solutions, uh, you have to use really strong acids like sulfuric acid or methane sulfonic acid. And, and this, this could have to do with the sort of um, lowest basic amides along the backbone, probably be protonated that'll help to sort of separate the individual polymer chains to make them solvated along the way. So a, a, an alternative way to go and uh, make Kevlar you know, go into solution would be to simply take the polymer and um, modify it directly. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm gonna go steal this image from before since I've already gone and corrected the bracket. I had the bracket wrong on in the. Oh no, it didn't. There we go. Um, so we can in the last lecture, I, I, I had the bracket in the wrong place. So note that it should be on the inside so that the nitrogen here is directly attached to this carbon left to make an amide bond. And so this is an example of polymer post polymerization modification. So we're actually gonna be doing reaction chemistry on the polymer chain itself. Uh, we'll have a sort of short section on this at the towards the end of the semester as well. And, and this is some work that uh, actually Dr. Reynolds here at Georgia Tech did uh, way back in 1990, before he was even at Georgia Tech. Um, so if you don't know Dr. Reynolds, he is in the chemistry, School of Chemistry and Biochemistry. If I can spell his name. Um, he, and he works uh, considerably in the area of sort of conjugated uh, polymers for photovoltaics and um, battery applications. And what he did, he was interested in trying to uh, improve the sol water solubility of Kevlar. Um, they, were, they were trying to work towards this end. Uh, there's a macromolecules paper that describes this research that's in the lecture six folder on Canvas right now. And what he did is he would 
uh, sodium hydride and DMSO to deprotonate Kevlar. So this would give us polymer chains that have some of these nitrogens deprotonated. So you end up with now polymers that are anionic. Note that hydride is going to be a base. Um, there are two electrons with the hydrogen, so it will be able to go and abstract one of the nitrogens from the amides to make it go back. And you could draw this charge on the oxygen or the nitrogen. I'm just drawing it on the nitrogen right now because this is always how it reacts. Um, note that usually it will only deprotonate one of these two nitrogens. So if it deprotonates this nitrogen, it won't deprotonate this nitrogen as well. Um, if, if you were to imagine having this type of structure, uh, this would be very high energy because these two nitrogens can communicate with each other across the, the benzene ring. So if we imagine trying to make one of these fragments, um, this di-anion will actually be too high in energy. Once you deprotonate the first nitrogen, it will increase the pKa of the neighboring one significantly because this other nitrogen will end up having a lot of charge repulsion and um, will make it far more difficult to deprotonate. So you usually can be able to get one of these two um, to react along the way, um, and usually not more than that. And he added in the sort of interesting uh, cyclic sulfur compounds. And this, this whole portion here, so are very good leaving groups. So if you imagine this oxygen leaving, which is what happens in the reaction, the nitrogen will attack this carbon to do an SN2 reaction will end up having a derivative form. Well, now we've made a nitrogen carbon bond, one, two, three carbons. And we end up with this very stabilized sulfonic acid but it's deprotonated, so it's just a sulfonate. So it'll have a sodium counterion along with it that comes from the original sodium hydride. And this now will allow the, the Kevlar to do a few different things. Note that now we've removed one of these strong hydrogen bond donors. So now it's not be able to make these long extended networks as well. This, this side chain that we brought in in general will now start to bring uh, formal negative charges to the chain, so it'll make them actually probably um, not want to be next to each other just due to uh, charge repulsion to some extent. And also, this negatively charged unit will help it to dissolve in water much better. So this, is, this ends up being a water-soluble um, polyelectrolyte. So electrolyte usually means salt. So essentially there's just a, a number of different types of charges along the backbone. And these types of polymers are useful in a number of applications and have been of interest to a variety of um, theoretical polymer chemists as well, trying to study their behavior. Um, polyelectrolytes are actually one of the topics on, on this sheet. Um, people have developed this field quite a bit since. So this is just one way that you can take Kevlar. Note that by putting on these modifications, you are going to be impacting the mechanical properties as well, because we do lack this, uh, or it will hinder the formation of these hydrogen bond networks. Um, also note that while this particular electrophile was used because they wanted to put these charge units to um, give enhanced water solubility, you could also potentially take this same type of polymer and react it with something like methyl iodide or other types of alkyl iodides and really put anything you want onto the polymer backbone so long as um, 
you know, it's going to be soluble in TMXO4 reaction. So this general idea would allow you to make a number of Kevlar derivatives that would likely have um, enhanced solubility profiles, of course, at the expense of um, some of the properties. All right, and, and one, one last sort of note on uh, aramid chemistry, and, and this is an example that I, I, I really like from the literature. Um, and this is, this is a chain growth polymerization of aramids. And, and this was developed by uh, Yokozawa and co-workers um, in 2000. Um, so you can read the paper. Um, it's in from, from Jax. It's also in the, the same folder. Um, I, I would encourage reading this. I view this chemistry as being I would say, certainly testable um, in both sort of concept of how it works and maybe some of the details. So I'd certainly encourage you to read this paper as well. It's not very long. Um, and, and what's kind of curious about this is that they use what is essentially an AB monomer. So we have an amine here that is going to be your A. We have an ester with a uh, phenylate leading group, which is a good leading group as far as esters go, that is sort of your B. And usually everything we've learned so far to date is that AB monomers should go through step growth condensation chemistry and give you, um, you know, dispersity of two at high conversions and, and should not have chain growth behavior. So I, I wanted to highlight this example as a way to show some of these um, sort of aromatic ring effects in chemistry and how some clever reaction design and how you set up these polymerizations can change the uh, underlying nature of the polymerization mechanism. So there, there's two features. Uh, we're going to have n number of these uh, AB monomer and solution. And we're going to have, let's just have one equivalent of this nitro um, benzoate derivative. And this will be like an initiator. So along the way, uh, Yokozawa orders, they, they took this mixture and they added in a strong base. So I'll, I'll, the base they use, I'll mention in a minute. But just to get the general idea, this is going to be a strong enough base to now deprotonate one of one of these nitrogens shown here. And we're going to deprotonate all of the monomers that are in solution. So we're still going to have our initiator around. This is before it even has a chance to react. But we need to talk about what's going on with this deprotonated AB monomer. So by deprotonating the nitrogen, you've now made it more nucleophilic. There's more electron density on, on this atom. So it wants to attack an electrophile. And we just mentioned in the AB monomers, the ester here is going to be our electrophile. But it turns out there's another consequence of deprotonating this nitrogen. And this comes from resonance delocalization. So if we take this lone pair, we can actually push the electrons all the way through the aromatic ring and into this ester as well. So we have a important resonance structure where this nitrogen is actually changing the reactivity of the ester across the ring. And what it does is essentially make this ester no longer reactive for a nucleophilic attack. So while we now made our nitrogen much more nucleophilic, we actually killed the reactivity of what needs to be our leaving group in polymerization. So we can say this is a poor electrophile. And so when you have all these deprotonated monomers in solution, there's only one thing that it can really do. And the only reactive ester around is going to be on this initiator group. And not only is this um, phenyl ester not deactivated by a deprotonated group opposite the ring, we actually have a substituent, this nitro, that is an electron withdrawing group, and it'll be an even better electrophile. So we have a very good electrophile. So 
So now we can have the pathway take place where this nitrogen will be able to attack this ester. We'll go to the tetrahedral intermediate, and this will be able to lose the phenylate anion along the way. So we've essentially initiated polymerization. We've now made our first amide bond. And as an added benefit, we did something else as well. So we still have many of these deprinted monomers in solution. They still can't react with themselves. But now we have revealed a new ester that no longer has the anion directly opposite. So now this is available for nucleophilic attack. So this is a good electrophile again. And this happens over and over again. But if these deprinted monomers that are not self-reactive will selectively be able to react at the chain end of at, at the at the growing chain end uh, from what was initiated from a nitro aromatic ring. So each time it reacts, it becomes reactive again. So sort of this uh, time timing scenario where um, it's only reactive as it's after it's added to a chain end. And this gives us you know the the, the normal sort of chain growth character where we start from initiator and we're able to add on one monomer at a time in a directional fashion with ideally minimal side reactions of the AB monomers with themselves. And, and Yokozawa was able to uh, demonstrate that this was actually a controlled living process. It had chain growth character, and it was a sort of curious case of chain growth behavior from uh, what looks to be a step growth monomer. Um, I'll note that uh, in the paper, they use some interesting uh, conditions for the base. They actually use a a nitrogen that has a silicon group on it. attached to an aromatic ring that does not have a electron electron group on it. So when they when they have this and they mix it in combination with a fluoride anion, this generates the active base that is just a deprotonated analyte. Um, fluoride is fluoride really likes silicon, so it's able to attack the silicon. The driving force of this is making TMS fluoride, which, which one is a, a gas that can be removed. And also fluoride loves silicon, so it has a very strong um, bond enthalpy, which will drive it towards this um, deprotonated nitrogen. And this is the active base in the polymerization. They, they did this largely for practical considerations. Um, you can imagine this being any sort of super strong base and you should in principle get the, the same overall effect. All right. Now, now we're gonna we're gonna change gears for a minute. We're gonna switch over from amides and now start looking at polyesters. And, and the the first example of polyesters we're going to look at is one you may have heard of before is PET or polyethylene tera phthalate. And so we've already talked about making esters in sort of the Fischer esterification approach. This one's going to be uh, a little bit different. We're going to learn about the, the two-step approach for making PET. And this is largely driven by sort of practical considerations um, and also teaches us some ideas about uh, how to use the equilibria of reactions to our advantage. So it starts with a molecule called dimethyl terephthalate, or D3, 
DMT, not the illicit drug. Um, and you mix it with ethylene glycol. And, and the strange thing here is usually, again, uh, the, what we've been learning to date is that in step growth polymerizations, you would want equal stoichiometry between the two. But we're actually going to have about two equivalents of this. So we're going to have way more alcohols than esters around. And we're going to do this in the presence of a catalyst to allow transesterification to occur. And we're going to heat this to about 150 degrees to 200 degrees Celsius. And by being at these temperatures, um, this will allow us to drive off all of the methanol. So we're going to lose methanol in the process. So it'll allow us to push the equilibrium forward to make a terephthalate derivative that has two different alcohol and groups. Two esters, and now we have two alcohols. So this adds on to both ends. Uh, along the way, you might get some oligomers as well, but they are inconsequential, because in the end, we do want to be making polymers at the end of the day. So now we're going to take this, this mixture that is going to be um, mostly this uh, small molecule product, and we're going to have you know, a similar catalyst. And now we're going to go and once again, just heat it up even more. So now we're going to go to 270 to 280 degrees Celsius. This will allow continual uh, transesterification reaction between these alcohols and different esters. And over time, we're actually going to build up the polyethylene terephthalate polymer chain. So I'm going to, again, just go and probably cheat here. And, and this involves the same sort of idea because we're going to end up being an equilibrium between some sort of polymer or oligomer that has, that has been generated. And also, we'll start making ethylene glycol as a byproduct in the equilibrium. But now that we're at even higher temperatures, this is well above the boiling point of ethylene glycol. So when you apply vacuum, now this can just be distilled off and removed. And this will end up pushing the equilibrium all the way forward to actually make high molecular weight uh, PET, polyethylene terephthalate. Um, note that the melting point, the TM of PET, is 258 degrees Celsius. And this tells us why we really want to have temperatures that are going to be in excess of that melting temperature because we can't have the polymer you know crystallizing along the way if we want to be removing all the ethylene glycol we want this to be above the melting point so that we're able to still have a processable liquid where we can be pumping off the ethylene glycol along the way uh, so PET is known um, by really a number of different names um, you can see it as uh, like mylar, uh, dacron, uh, terylene. So there's a number of trade names associated with it. Um, really, the advantage of doing this two-step process is that you never, at any point in time, need a uh, stoichiometric ratio. Everything is driven by equilibrium-based reactions, where you can just push it to completion, irrespective of the um, stoichiometry. Um, PET has a variety of uses as uh, sort of uh, plastics and fibers. Uh, you probably see it like in plastic bottles. So um, but it's generally viewed as being very strong and tough. Um, and fatigue resistant up to about uh, 150 to 170 degrees Celsius. So it has a decent range of operating temperatures where it can still maintain uh, these sorts of properties. Um, it's slow to crystallize, so I did quote a melting temperature, um, but it doesn't crystallize very fast. This is just a kinetic effect of the polymer. 
Um, so frequently people will add in nucleating agents if you want to make semi-crystalline PET. So just like if you've ever had uh, um, tried to grow crystals in the lab, um, you can have a you know saturated solution and then add in an existing crystal or some sort of even uh, particle impurity will will seed and accelerate the nucleation of crystal growth. And and the same is true uh, for for polymers as well. So something that you, you may want to sort of think about along the way um, is while while we usually think about you know building polymers as these reactions go as reactions go where we have you know reactions of chain ends with new monomers to build up polymers um, really along this polymer backbone we have many of these ester groups right and and as the polymer is growing it's also doing reactions with the backbone. So it could choose to react with, you know, an ester at a chain end, but it could also equally as likely react with a pol uh, an ester in the middle. So I think it's useful to try to imagine um, during these polymerizations that really there's a lot of equilibration going on between polymer chains. In addition to just, you know, building them up, there's a lot of extra reactions that take place that essentially don't contribute to any polymer growth necessarily. And maybe as a way to like visualize this, you can kind of do the thought experiment of having um, two polymers of different molecular weights. So one might be high, one might be low. And let's imagine we're looking at like a size exclusion chromatogram that gives us an idea of the distribution of the, the two polymer chains. So here we're gonna have signal, um, we could even make this axis molecular weight, so log molecular weight if you want. And so we could have a low molecular weight polymer here. This is sort of its distribution. We could have another polymer that is going to be higher molecular weight. It'll have another distribution. Um, we could mix these two polymers together that on their own have two individual populations. You could now heat these up with a catalyst and over time, if they were allowed to equilibrate for long enough, we would, we would end up having essentially equilibration of these two polymer chains to merge into one common polymer chain that would have just one single intermediate molecular weight that would be between the two for our new polymer. So these would be able to sort of mix and max to give us one medium molecular weight uh, polymer at the end of the day. And, and this, this, is, this can be useful from time to time. Um, there, and especially in uh, the development of different types of copolymers, which, which we'll talk about here in a sec. So as probably many of you are, are aware, um, many polymers that we use today, know and love, they are not necessarily the, uh, the, the greenest materials. A lot of them are petroleum derived and uh, there's constantly you know, searching going on to either try to um, find better starting materials to make polymers of um, equal or better properties. Uh, cost is always a, a factor in this as well because most things that are petroleum derived and that have been have processes that are optimized that are extremely cheap, um, or alternatively ways we can recycle. So, I, uh, this is just to highlight that uh, one of the strategies people have come up with to try to take something that is renewable um, and turn it into a essentially PET-like material. And so, so in this process, uh, this was developed by some chemists in the Netherlands. And you can just start from simple sugars. Um, I'm not sure if anybody here is involved with the Renewable Bioproducts Institute here at Georgia Tech. Um, I'm not gonna draw stereochemistry on fructose, but you probably all have heard of the sugar fructose as well. Um, it's a pentose. Um, and, and this can be dehydrated through known processes to lose water and make these furan derivatives. 
Um, and once you fully dehydrate this, you end up having some loss of water molecules. You make this aromatic furan ring in the middle, and you end up with now an aldehyde and an alcohol. So this isn't quite the right oxidation state, but there are inexpensive ways to oxidize this to two different carboxylic acids. So alcohol can be oxidized twice to a carboxylic acid. The aldehyde can be oxidized once. And now we have a building block that you can imagine being like an AA type monomer. This is called furanoic acid. Um, and in a, in a similar way, now you can take furanoic acid and do condensation chemistry with ethylene glycol. And we can make a new polymer, which as you can see, looks really quite a bit like polyethylene terephthalate. Only now we've exchanged this central benzene ring for a furan. And this is called polyethylene furanoate. Um, so in the Netherlands, they make, I think, at least somewhere recently, about 300 to 500 kilotons a year, which already for me is a, an unfathomable amount. Um, it, it's still not nearly as much as you know the amount of PET that's 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 generated. That's uh, I think probably in the realm of like 9.5 billion pounds or more. Um, and that's in the US. So probably, yes, billions and billions of pounds of PET are made. Um, so this is certainly much lower scale. Um, but there are actually, in addition to being renewably sourced for fructose, uh, this also has better water and gas barrier properties. If you're looking to use it for food packaging. It has a higher glass transition temperature. It has a lower melting temperature. So if you're looking to go and, and take this material and um, reprocess it, um, that means it'll be able to, you'll be able to heat it up and have a lower melting temperature to, to reshape it. Um, a higher GG means it probably has a higher operating temperature before it starts to soften. And this also displays a higher modulus as well. Um, and, and these materials are recyclable. Let's see if I can draw the recycling arrows, cool. And so they're, they're looking to, to you know, take this material and actually um, re repurpose it in a um, consideration of its overall uh, sort of carbon life cycle. So you can start from a sugar, make a polymer, and perhaps take that polymer and recycle it again in order to um, not have quite so much waste um, in the world. So next we're going to talk about ester copolymers, or really this is just you know copolymers in general. Um, we haven't really uh, discussed these all too much, um, but in general, the idea is you can have two different monomers come together. Um, again, we can say let's just call this monomer A, monomer B, is B A A B B. So we've seen a lot of examples maybe of you know A B copolymers. But if we imagine these are each AB polymers, so they're, the way that they are organized can actually um, end up leading to a lot of different possible scenarios. And so the order in which you have monomers placed along a polymer chain can really lead to a, a variety of different uh, behavior. Uh, so, so one class of polymers I wanted to mention are called block polymers. Um, and, and this is where we're going to end up having a number of say A monomers all connected to one another in a row. 
And then at, at the other side of the polymer chain, we just have another sequence of all B polymers that follow a line. So we kind of have two different blocks of two homopolymers that are joined at one point to give now two different segments. So this, this would be called a dye block polymer. Dye because there are two. You can imagine having different orders where it's either, you know, three different types of monomers with three different sequences, that'd be a tri-block. Um, that people are interested in the in the sequences of monomers in a copolymer backbone because how these different monomers are arranged will lead to different properties. Um, and this is mainly building up to an example I'll show you on the on the next slide. Uh, but just to kind of go through a few other different types, um, if you had A and B together and just sort of a random arrangement, this would be called a random copolymer. Uh, let's see how how random I can make this. You could have two right next to one another. You may have a series where they're alternating and they're going to be kind of joined again. And again, there's not any regular long range order um, amongst these systems. So imagine there aren't any true gaps between any of these monomers, they're all connected. And you can even have ones that um, will be sometimes more in one, sense, one end and then kind of lean towards another at the other. So this means they are a gradient copolymer. So this is where we might have, essentially you start off and it's all red, and then these will slowly fade to being essentially all blue at the other side. So we see it'll be this slow um, change in arrangement where we are red dominant at one end of the polymer and we get to a blue dominant at the other end. And these are frequently encountered actually in chain growth polymerization where how two monomers react can control the sequence. Where if they have equal reactivity, you'll have a random distribution. If you mixed red and blue together and red polymerize faster, you might end up with more of them at one end of the polymer chain versus the end. Or if you're able to do living polymerizations, you could just add in um, just red followed by blue and make things like dye blocks. But there's also ways to use step growth polymerization to give you different types of architectures, depending on how much of the different co-monomers you start with. And actually, this is how you kind of define what a monomer is. Um, and as you perhaps can even you know, start to imagine, if you had something like where red was hydrophobic and blue was hydrophilic, then you're going to end up with these amphiphiles where these two polymer chains don't like each other. And this is the basis of a tremendous amount of research in uh, phase separation where these two phases are trying to run away from one another and essentially they will lead to a lot of interesting self-organized structures. So the, the main idea here, at least at this point, is that the microstructure or the sequence of monomers will impact the properties. This is one more facet of um, sort of sophistication we can use in designing copolymers. And, and this is uh, building up to sort of an example that um, I have here. Um, for what we, was an interesting idea of a thermoplastic elastomer. We, we mentioned uh, this uh, earlier on, I think in one of the first lectures of technically what this is, and, uh, and I'll reiterate it again uh, as we go through this example. But first I wanted to just kind of start with um, you know, the different monomers that are, that are present. Um, the sort of copolymer aspect derives from us having two different diols around. Um, one is just a small molecule uh, butylene glycol, and then the other one is is actually going to be a polymer on in its own right. So this is going to already be a number of repeating units. This is going to be a long polymer chain that just so happens to still have the same. Um, so this is going to be a very long polymer that still has these alcohol chain ends. So they'll be able to react with the. the um, dimethyl terephthalate uh, for their monomer. And so if you were to mix these all up together, 
uh, assuming you have you know the right stoichiometry of alcohols to esters, we're going to make a new copolymer that now is fairly complicated. So I wanted to kind of discuss what goes on. Um, if we do this with heat and a catalyst, we're going to drive off all of the methanol. We're going to drive off the excess, some of the excess um, butylene glycol to some extent, but some of it will be incorporated into the polymer chain. And the um, polybutylene glycol, which is also called uh, poly-THF, because it comes from the ring opening of tetrahydrofuran, the solvent. Um, we'll end up with these new copolymer materials where you see we have these blue domains that are shown here. We also have these sort of red domains, all linked by the same um, terephthalate linking groups. And so depending on how much you know, butylene glycol you add, um, there's actually going to be one more layer of sort of brackets we can add into this copolymer, where actually we're going to have a different number of these repeating units within. So we could call this, say, X. So we kind of have these polymer units within inside polymer units. And so this will actually end up overall having um, block polymer characteristics. We're going to have segments of red followed by longer segments of blue, because we already started with blue being a polymer, followed by other segments of red, and so on. So this would be a multi-block polymer, because it's not just di-block. We don't know how many segments there are, because this is going to be occurring through chain growth polymerization. But the other thing to kind of take notice of is the different material properties that will arise from the two different sub so if we start to try to now uh, break down the two components, we, we have um, on one hand, this repeating unit here, which would be sort of just the polyester derived from butylene glycol and dimethyl terephthalate. Um, these will be sort of short chains. These will be higher glass transition, so higher TG units. These will um, be semi-crystalline. So these will be able, these repeating units will be able to pack together to, to make crystallites in the material. Um, and then on the other hand, we're going to go and have another segment, which is really best described as just this polybutylene glycol, this, this blue repeating unit. This is where the material properties come from on the other part of the blue polymer. And, and this is going to be, um, you know, long chain with low glass transition temperature. There's many more rotatable bonds, a, a lot more degrees of freedom. We will have um, many interceptions of these bulky ester groups that will um, slow down segmental motion and also won't be able to pack as well. So this will be amorphous in, in the blue ring. So while the chemical structure gets, gets a bit complicated, I, I think what we want to focus on are just sort of the hard nature of the red blocks. So this is going to be sort of like a hard block. And we can imagine the blue blocks being soft and flexible, or the, or the red ones have higher glass transition temperature um, and will be able to crystallize. So, so the other aspect that um, it's maybe not direct immediately apparent is that these two segments actually don't like each other. Um, they are phase um, in incompatible. So So the red and the, the blue blocks will actually phase segregate, just like oil and water. They want to run away from one another, but they can't completely run away from one another because they're attached through covalent bonds. So the best they can do is try to maximize as much of themselves into sort of their own domains. And so these will actually start to phase separate. They will all maximize their sort of tensions and surface areas to create sort of a, a new overall phase material. And what this will look like is we're going to have these small hard sections. And I'll, whenever they are in these islands, 
they will go and form crystallites within the material. And they will be kind of localized all by themselves. And they're going to be surrounded by this blue matrix. And this blue matrix is now going to be quite soft. They're going to surround, encapsulate all of the red hard domains. And this has an interesting consequence on the overall material properties. So since all of these different groups are bound to one another, you end up having long polymer chains that will then start to crystallize inside these red domains. So no, remember that these are crystalline. So if we're below the melting point, these essentially act as you know um, solids in a lot of ways. They're hard, and these will act as physical crosslinks between this sort of sea of of blue soft polymer. Um, so these are called physical crosslinks. And, and this will keep all of the material intact. So you want to imagine there's, there's individual blue polymers um, that are kind of um, interconnected between these red segments. So we're gonna have multiple polymers that will all be interconnecting these hard domains. So this means if you were to touch the material, it'd be fairly soft to the touch, but it'd be able to regain its shape because all of the red domains kind of keep the long range order of the physical, of the actual material. So what, what, this, what this lets us do is have something that is shape persistent. It'll be elastomeric, that's the name, elastomer. Um, but at the same time, if you heat this above the melting temperature, it will be fully reprocessable. So um, as long as we are below the melting temperature, it's all held together. You heat it up to a sufficiently high temperature. Now all of these different domains are able to break apart. You're able to reprocess. And then if you cool it back down, they will phase separate again, forming these domains under the proper conditions. And you'd be able to uh, use the same part for another application. Reprocessable. I can't spell process. What's also, I think, kind of interesting from the perspective of a copolymer is the actual material properties that you get within this uh, copolymer. Um, the, the copolymer here is actually has, has a name. Um, this specific one is called Hytro. It's developed by DuPont. Um, and depending on how much of the butylene glycol fragment versus the polybutylene glycol, um, you'll actually get a, a range of material properties. So in this material, you can have the, the TMs. Um, they're fairly narrow in range. They're about 175 to 200 degrees Celsius. Um, but the glass transition is quite tunable, anywhere from minus 80 degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius. And this is all depending on, you know, how much of the dominant fraction is going to be the, this soft blue blue component. So we have tunability in copolymers simply based off of the nature of the monomers and how much we end up um, putting into the material. All right. All right. Now we're gonna we're gonna shift gears a bit. We're gonna talk about polycarbonates to kind of wrap us up on this lecture. Um, polycarbonates look a lot like esters, but they are not called esters because we end up having two oxygens around the central carbonyl. Um, as a general sort of um, retrosynthetic viewpoint of how you make a polycarbonate, um, we're gonna end up having um, some blue diol. This will be the blue diol from before, after our retrosynthesis era. So we're going to go back to a diol, and we need to add in a carbonyl group. And this carbonyl group will have two leaving groups attached to it. So we're going to have two groups that will be able to leave off the central carbonyl, 
So we can imagine having, you know, each of these alcohols attack and displace the leaving groups to eventually build up a polymer chain. So the, the, the simplest example of this is actually if each of these two leaving groups are fluorides. So we can see that in this example, this, this is a molecule that's called phosgene. It is um, a pretty nasty chemical. It's very reactive. Now, people don't like to use it a whole lot because it is a nerve agent. It, is, it has been used as a chemical warfare agent. Um, uh, not, not a, it has great uh, reactivity in, in, the, in the chemistry world, does a lot of good things, but unfortunately um, it has some undesired side effects. Um, and, and the classical polycarbonate material that, that uh, people use, sometimes they just call it polycarbonate even though it refers to a class of materials, is, is the one made by, from phosgene and uh, BPA or bisphenol A, something you also probably have a knee-jerk reaction to as being um, bad in this world. Um, so these are used um, all the time in, in industry. This is, this is used a lot because you can make it from like acetone and phenol, hence the name bisphenol A. And it makes some really, really nice materials from inexpensive starting materials. Um, so the, the simplest way to imagine doing this is just a fast solution polymerization. Um, we have pyridine here. So pyridine actually acts as a base and a catalyst. Um, so if you have phosgene on its own, pyridine is nucleophilic at nitrogen. It's actually more nucleophilic than the phenols are as the oxygens. Um, so phenols usually aren't terribly nucleophilic unless you deprotonate them. But the pyridine will be able to add in to phosgene, go through the tetrahedral intermediate. It will be able to then kick out the chloride. And after the chloride is displaced, we end up with this charged pyr acyl pyridinium intermediate that is very reactive that even neutral phenols can uh, react with. So you end up having a combination of both probably the pyridine deprotoning the bisphenol A to attack and going through this sort of activated intermediate. And along the way, you, you make the polymer you can probably predict, these BPA classes. We're gonna keep track of all of the groups we need. So the end group would at first at least be this chloride um, under these reaction conditions. And 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 um, as I mentioned, you've probably um, interacted with quite a bit of BPA plastic in your life. This is a very common polycarbonate. Uh, people people like it a lot. Uh, this material has um, a high TM that can be crystallized at around 270 degrees C. Um, it, though it's usually used as amorphous because they really like its uh, transparent nature. So it has good transparency. Recall that if you have uh, crystallinity, then um, you end up having these crystallites diffract light, which gives an opaque nature to it. Um, and its glass room temperature on its own is quite high, which is around 150 degrees Celsius. So a lot of um, you know, rigid aromatic units in the bathroom. And this goes by a, a number of um, you know, common names in the literature or, or in industry, um, like Lexan or Merlon, or just PC for polycarbonate. And you know, there's at least I think there's in 2001 there is three three billion pounds worldwide made per year, so really tremendous quantities of this being uh, generated. Um, this being all, A is also one of the polymers that can be made through interfacial polymerization as well. Um, so you can do this interfacially.
so so usually this will will um, involve similarly um, taking the same BPA monomer. Oops. Um, we'll add in the phosgene. You'll have water and an appropriate organic solvent. And you'll also be adding in a phase transfer catalyst. So whenever you do this reaction, the, these are just um, sort of counter ions that will help solubilize the bisphenol A um, anion. So under these reactions with uh, base present, we will end up making some of the phenylate anion. That is the anionic component that will need to be transferred along the way. Because otherwise it's going to be hydrophobic and it'll, it would just have sort of classical um, solution polymerization characters, characteristics. Um, and this will go to make polycarbonate as well. They can get molecular weights that are, you know, 200 um kilodaltons so 200,000 molecular weight polymers this way and and this is actually uh most used industrially this is one of the cases where um the the normally expensive component of you know different acid chlorides phosgene ends up being simple enough that it is uh, it can be quite expensive this would be our water soluble um, alternative and since people you know don't really like the idea of using uh, phosgene all the time um, th there, there are some other methods as well to make the same material um, I mentioned above that the leaving groups on the central carbonyl don't need to be chlorides and uh, people have taken you know bisphenol A and instead of chlorides, you have phenoxide leaving groups, where you end up having a similar equilibrium scenario with an appropriate catalyst, where you're actually going to remove phenol, which is relatively volatile compared to the um, polymer, certainly. And you can, with enough heat, drive it towards uh, polycarbonate as well. All right, by looking at my recording time, I think I'm about at the 115 mark. So perhaps I ramble a bit to myself more than usual if uh, I don't have an audience in front of me. Um, so I'm going to, uh, skip this example. Uh, this is another example from the literature. If you want to go ahead and read it, it'll be the Brunel paper. I'll put this in the lecture seven folder. And we'll start with that uh, on Thursday. So we'll add it to the list. And we'll also start talking about multi-chain branching, cross-linking, and different examples of cross-linking technology. So. Um, Please feel free to post on uh, Piazza if there's questions or ask me next time. Um, otherwise, I'll see you on Thursday.